What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to cover six programming languages and show you how you can avoid primitive obsession. Jesse Warden. Now, primitive obsession, if you're not aware, is when you have functions or methods with primitive data types, strings, numbers, booleans, and they have multiple versions of those, and you can mess up the order. So if a function takes string, 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 and you mess up the order, it'll break at runtime, and you don't know why, because the code looks good, but you can't see the order in functions. And so there's a couple ways to fix it. We're gonna show you in a bunch of different languages, uh, different strategies. We're not gonna show you the DTO way or data transfer object or value object. It's a way where you take a class object, you have a record, order doesn't matter then because the function only takes one parameter and the fields in the record can be in any order. Yes, but sometimes you want those types from a domain modeling perspective. It's sometimes easier to read those types and you might wanna use them elsewhere. So again, that's what we're trying to do here is if we're gonna invest the effort to get the compiler to work with us, it, when it compiles, it actually works. It doesn't compile and then we have a runtime exception. Lastly, it, it's readable. You don't look at a function and go bool, it's true. Look, what does that mean? Adding these custom types of light to read it. So we're gonna cover these six languages of Python, dynamic language with a little bit of typing on top using MyPy, TypeScript, which is type language, but compiles to JavaScript, so offers a little bit more guarantees and the compiler and type checker are the same thing on like in Python. Rescript, which is a very similar to TypeScript, it's just faster and has more sound types and has different ways that you can make a little bit more smaller, easier ways of making those wrapper types. And then Elm, which is the most strictest compiler of all, but has very similar concepts to Rescript. So you can see the two in action, some of the problems that you have in that. And so you have this wonderful compiler and you can break. So it's, it's fascinating to see how you can fix that and prevent that. And then JavaScript and GraphQL. If you're using GraphQL to guarantee that you have types across borders, right? So it's one thing to mess up a type language on the client, but if you send those strong types that you feel are good and the server's written in a dynamic language like JavaScript and loses a lot of that type information, what do you do there? And then GraphQL, you're using types across layers. So it's very important to get it right in GraphQL because you can affect the client and the server. So GraphQL is a very interesting language with JavaScript, which is dynamic. Weird combo. And then Doll, some of the biggest website breakages that we've seen in our industry in the past 10 years have been from configuration, not code. And if that's the case, then how do you prevent that? Well, Doll helps you have more correct renderings of those configurations. It's not everything you can do, it's just a good first step. And so having these six languages, how we use very similar, but sometimes different implementation standards, gives you a better perspective because you can see how they all do the same thing, but slightly different way. And like our all architecture, it's a series of trade-offs. Are the trade-offs worth it? Do they feel good in that particular language? Is it easier in that language to do that kind of strategy? So when you are done with this video, you'll have that knowledge of how you approach that same problem in multiple languages, be able to compare and contrast, talk about what those trade-offs are, and feel really good about the problem it's solving and how you're making your code more likely to work, more leveraging your compiler if you use one, and more readable for yourself now and your coworkers and yourself in the future. Let's take a look at the code first to see what it's doing since all the code examples are doing the exact same thing. And that is they are parsing some kind of primitive person object, whether from user input or some third party system and coming into their system. So the number one source of bugs, whether dynamic or typed, is when you're getting input from somewhere that's not in your language. It wasn't created in a pure way, a safe way. And so you have to validate it to make sure that it works. From a dynamic language perspective, it's a lot easier to do this because you can do some really quick checks, even at runtime with reflection. In type languages, it is a lot harder because you need to make a lot of checks to make sure that the data is really what you think it is and the shape you want. And it's just a really hard thing to do. A lot of this code is validating these data types at runtime, this part person that we're trying to parse to. And we want, at the end of the day, some kind of record or object or data class to represent that. You'll notice in Python, it often has a library called typings, and you can go from typings, imports all kinds of different things like strings and union types and things like that, but it's just generally not very good. It's not mature enough, it's getting there, they're making some progress. But there's a lot of other classes that you can import in data types, and using the MyPy strongly typed compiler, very similar to TypeScript, but it doesn't actually compile, it just checks your code for errors. If you're also from a Roblox background using Lua, Luau is another one where it can check your code, but it kind of ignores the types at runtime. So if you add types in here, such as 
you know, this is a team and a string, and this one has neither of those types. You can leave those in there, and the runtime will just ignore them. But if you use a tool such as MyPy, it can use this to really help get better compiler errors and better typing runtime errors. So it's good to do. All right, so let's go down to the bottom and see what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get this strongly typed data class, something that's shaped very correctly with a team that this person's from, their name, their age, and their phone number. And we're going to create a function that's going to get these values from some third party place. It could be from a disk, it could be a user typing in a program, whatever. And in Python, most of those are from a function. So this get person is going to take that data in order. And if you hover over it, you can see that it takes a team, a name is a string, an age and, and a phone number. And so if we go here and click get person, it's going to take that data and do a series of steps. It's going to validate that the name is legit from a string perspective. It's going to validate the phone number is also legit from a phone perspective and then validate the age is good whatever those validations are and then if it worked then we'll pop out a success if any one of these returns some kind of error or in this case result error the entire chain of functions will fail and we'll get a fail to get it out so if you're from a golang background this is very similar it either returns success or failure from javascript think of it like a promise that's synchronous it either works or it doesn't and so one of these validation steps, if all three succeed, we're going to get a person out. There's a bug in this code, and it's easier to see it if we run it. It's Python index one pi. And you'll notice that we're using data classes. The great thing about data classes is that they act kind of like functions, and you can just treat them as functions, passing your data in order, and it'll automatically add them to that. It'll print them out really nice instead of that horrible other syntax. There's another video I'll link to that talks a lot more in depth about data classes in Python. And they're just an easier way to create data transfer objects, DTOs, or value objects, VOs, data that has behavior that you would like to illustrate. But it's really about data. If you're from an object-oriented programming background, a lot of classes have both data and behavior. But sometimes classes like DTOs and VOs just have data. And so data classes were kind of created in Python to satisfy that use case, where you're just putting data in them. A lot of their behavior is based around showing the data, tweaking the data, having defaults, things like that. And so we're using that person. The issue is, is that we have multiple functions taking multiple primitives, or in this case, string and integers, primitive data types. This one isn't so primitive, right? And so it's taking multiples, in a certain order, and we can mess up that order. So if you look at the code hint, we'll scroll down, you can see that get person has team, name, age, and phone number, and we put it in the right order, team, name, age, phone number. But if we go to the actual success of creating that data class, the person, we treat it like a function, think of it like a constructor that you can call like a function, it takes the team, phone, age, and name. So although everything validated even at the very end we screw up one of the most core functions of our program that takes the data says it's legit and creates the data it created the data wrong so people are going to look at this code and get really confused because they look i validated everything how did this possibly happen how do we have a name with a phone number and a phone number of a name like that just drives me up the wall right and that's because we did things in the wrong order so this is despite a lot of effort and a lot of code based around validation, right? <laughs> None of it actually worked. You can fix the bug by reading that going, oh my gosh, I put it in the wrong order. Go back to name and then put the phone there, rerun our program, and we're good to go. Everything's in the correct order. And you can tell that if we were to mess it up here, for example, we'd have the same problem. So if we had, let's say the name last, and we had the phone number first, and then we tried to run it again, you could see that our validation would check it. It knows the difference between a name and a phone number. In this case, the failure is the phone cannot be less than nine characters because it was a name. And so that's good, but what if you had a really long name that was longer than nine characters? Let's try it. Oh, cow, man, that's way longer than nine characters. Let's see if that worked. Okay, so so far our validator's handling the bad inputs, but I can't tell the basics of, of two strings, right? And this is the joke where a lot of Haskell programmers, when they see strings, and functions, from a type perspective, they go, why is that untyped, <laughs> right? So we'll put this back to where the way it should be, right? the correct way of doing things. Run it again. You can see it worked. We'll run MyPy. MyPy is the way to do type checking on a Python program 
but it doesn't actually compile anything. It just looks at your Python code, looks at your type hints, either the ones that you write or the ones that it can kind of infer by just reading how the function is shaped. And we'll run it against our Py and see if everything looks, looks good here. And so far, so good. So there's no issues, despite the fact that we could screw up this code and it wouldn't have any idea, which is really disappointing. The runtime validation helps, but MyPy doesn't help from this perspective. So let's look at Python 2 to see how we fix it and to make sure that MyPy can find the bugs as well as a little bit more intelligible runtime errors versus having to wait for the validation store. So you'll notice that we have a team name here, which is a enum that's typed. But we've avoided the primitive here for strings as well. We've created these kind of wrappers around this, these wrapper types. So let's go take a look at where these things are defined. We'll scroll to the top and we've created yet another data class. And these data classes literally just wrap the type they're in. And we use this iteration method to make them easier to destructure. So if you're from a JavaScript perspective, you know what destruction is. You can take a big old gigantic object and just get one property out very easily. Python has a variety of destructuring syntax. It's very difficult to use. And with data classes, the only way to really make it simple is using this iteration method. We put name with a string inside of it of the same name, same with phone, and same with age, so that we differentiate. Now, again, we don't have multiple integers, so it's not really easy to put that in the wrong order because we know there's only one int in the function, but we're gonna use the same pattern so it's very clear when we read the code, what's, what's different? They all kind of look the same. They're all data classes that wrap a data type. So it's just making the code consistent. We're not gonna treat ints special, right? They are primitives too. And if we add more ints later, we already have a good established pattern to build upon. So we're setting a good precedent. So it's not just now, it's for future too. So you'll look at the definitions changed and now takes a name type, an age type and a phone type, right? And so it's a little more helpful from a MyPy perspective because then he can read it. And when you look at the creating the person, the actual data class, it has types as well. So if you go up to the person data class, it has the team, the name, the age, and the phone on those particular types rather than the primitives. Let's run uh, MyPy against our code real quick. We'll say MyPy2. And you can see everything's good to go. And if we run Python index2Py, everything looks good. It's got a success. It's got a team and a name, and an age, and a phone. Fantastic. Now, it is a bit hard to read. We're not going to mess with team right now from an enum, but if you want to follow the same pattern of a class, the data class wrapped with the same name property, it's really easy to know that you can just go name.name, .name, age, age because they all follow the same pattern of being the name the same thing that they wrap, phone.phone. .phone. So now when you run it again, you can actually make it readable once again. So just minor things, little teensy behavior modifications to a class, mainly around data, but just helping yourself read it at runtime and parse it. Let's see what happens when we reverse these things. We're not gonna use MyPy. We're just simply gonna reverse it. And we'll put phone in front. Now again, reading this function, there's no indication of what parameter goes where. You'd have to hover over and get some kind of code hint to see that the team name, team phone, something's off, right? But let's say you didn't and you run it again. Now you're getting something that phone should be less than nine characters. You count and it's very confusing because clearly it's more than nine characters. So not really sure what's going on here. And this is where, okay, fine. Python's runtime errors aren't good enough. We haven't had any hints in there. Let's run MyPy, the type checker against our code using these data classes and see if it can find the bug. And you'll notice that it immediately finds that get person has an incompatible type of phone where it expected name. And we can infer so the sensors two that are opposite of each other, it's because they're in the wrong order. So using something as simple as a code hint, we can confirm with the compiler found in seconds. Now, one cost of doing this in Python is that now that they are types and we pass them to the validate functions, they have to know what it is. Because we use that iterator method, we can use what looks very similar to the JavaScript array syntax, destruction syntax. Here, we're using a list in Python just to pop out the name from this name type. And so now our entire function can continue to use the name because it's defined up here and the scope is all the way down. So you just do the same thing with phone and stuff like that. That's how you can fix the problem in Python, avoiding primitive obsession. A lot of people will immediately say, well, you could also just make a DTO or a data transfer object or a VO and you put the properties in here, team.red, phone, is, is whatever your phone number is, et cetera, and then pass that in as a single parameter, and that is very true. However, if you wanna use those data types in other places, then it's a lot more readable because it's just a class that represents its data type, 
And when you start doing domain modeling and you're modeling what your business domain is, you're dealing with people, so you're dealing with their attributes, you can reuse these things in other places and build more composites. So if you want to use these inside of a dictionary, that's fantastic. So even if you start changing all your functions to take one parameter and you solve the primitive primitive obsession by just creating records and all functions take one input for a lot of this complex data, that's fantastic. But you'll still have some of the runtime problems if the values in that dictionary are primitives. So using these data classes as the values in that dictionary is very helpful as well, both from a type checking perspective and a runtime perspective when you're trying to debug. And from a readability perspective, they can see it's a phone and a phone number, and it might have other helpful ways to display it from a runtime debug perspective. So that's Python using data class. We're going to go to TypeScript next. So unlike MyPy, MyPy's job is done, where TypeScript can kind of enforce some of those guarantees that it finds in your type at runtime because the compiled code knows about the types sometimes. So very similar code. It takes in a team name as a string, the name Jesse42 and whatever. And we're just using promises to emulate the ability to do a result like I was doing using PyMonad and Python. JavaScript has built-in promises which kind of work like a result object. They either work or they don't, and you just pop out the values. It's a way of wrapping values and then composing functions together in a very wonderful way. Let's run compile first. So say mq and run compile one. And it's running through the TypeScript compiler to check all our types. It's a lot slower than MyPy, for example, but it ran no errors. So basically no response means good news, right? It's, everything's good. So let's take a look at this function, see how it's typed. We've manually typed everything as a string. And because we didn't use an enum, then we now have an additional possible problem because now we have three strings. So it's even worse. And using those primitives, we have an ability to really mess it up even more. So let's see if we can duplicate our same bug where we move the name to the end and we move the phone number to the second position. So we'll just assume the team always goes first and we got lucky. We'll run the compiler again, and it's gonna say everything's good. So now we're gonna start that code. So let's go npm run start one. So it'll compile again, just in case, and then everything's good, it'll run that JavaScript file and then see what happens. And saying Jesse's not a valid phone number for person type, it failed to pass the validator. So the compiler says everything good. When you run the code, it doesn't work. And this is exactly why people get frustrated when they spend all this time and effort in types and it doesn't work at runtime. If you're gonna spend the time to add types, which are work and are noise to your code, they are more for you to read, more for you to understand. If you're gonna go to the effort of using these things, then you want the compiler to do the job that you asked it to do. And that is tell me if my code is mostly correct. So when I compile, I have confidence that it'll work. So let's make that compiler work for us. Let's go to TypeScript 2 and see what we can do to improve things. So the first thing we can do is go back to our enum that we learned from Python. So far, so good. We have what's called an or type. And if you think of like a discriminated union, this would be, I have either or, it's either blue or red. So you think of the or symbol from that perspective. This is one or the other. It can't be both at the same time. You can only be on team blue. We can only be on team red. So that's a good first start. Just like in Python, the difference from the enum and TypeScript is that this particular type, discriminated union type, allows us to have the compiler to help us to make sure it's one of these values. So if we mistype blue or red or type in green, it's not going to work. And that's why you saw the red at the bottom because already we got away from it being wrong. So we can still utilize the primitive, but we can type those primitives. So we can still get the feeling of using a string, but our compiler can help us see our strings is wrong. So a little more readable than doing that team.red or team.blue, right? You can just type in green, but the compiler can say, hey, hold on, I, I, I know you want a convenience of just going like this, but what you typed is wrong, and that's right. So great first step. Second, we're gonna type the aliases of a string. So a name is just an alias or another word for string. So when I use the word name, it means string. So this is a good first step from a readability perspective. What it does is says the name is a name type. The age is an age type. Phone is a phone type. So that's a great first step. The problem is there's still primitives. And these are different than this. So we fixed the team to be completely different type. But this, unfortunately, is not good enough. And I'll show you what I mean. We're going to go to the bottom. 
We still have our phone number is the first and the name is last. So when we run start two, it'll compile it and say that nothing's wrong with our code since we fixed the compiler error, but it's not gonna catch the fact that these are in the wrong order because they are both an alias of strings. So we give them a name type, but unfortunately that's not good enough to tell the compiler that they're different. If you think of the difference between nominally typed and structurally typed, this is what we mean is that they both have the same structure, right? They're both strings. Yeah, but not really, <laughs> right? So this is not good enough. You can't just do basic type aliasing. It works great for discriminated unions or records, but it doesn't quite work for aliases. So let's see if we can do this even better. So we'll go to number three here. Now we've created each one of those as a typed record. And the reason this is important is that this is now a distinct type from this because the name inside of it is different. So the records don't look the same. So if they both were like name, for example, it'd be very difficult to determine the difference between the two because they're both records with names. But now that they have names that mirror what they are, it, it's completely different. And so TypeScript can now recognize the difference between these two types. So when we go to the bottom, you can already see that the name of Jesse and then the name of phone doesn't work because there is no name. So even just without running the compiler, our IDE, Integrated Development Environment, AKA VS Code, is smart enough to run the types of compiler in the background and say, look, argument of type name is not a standard of phone. Phone doesn't look like that. So we, we say, okay, well, what is the type of phone? Type phone. It takes a phone string, not a name string. So we can change that to phone and that's fantastic. So even creating these new types, we get the compiler to help us. So we make sure we create them correctly so it can recognize them. Then when we start putting things in the wrong order, let's see what happens there. Already it says the phone is not assignable to parameter of type name. And so we go, well, that's a phone. So it knows it's a phone string. And that's because get person, we actually utilize those types. We actually use the name, the age, and the phone. So now TypeScript is smart enough to know the difference of them because not, are they just records, okay? but they have different shapes inside of those records. So really, really helpful. The challenge is, well, now that we've done that, we have to do a lot of refactoring to snag those things out. But again, if you follow that same pattern, it's very difficult to do this destruction as easily in Python. And here, you can literally destructure in the function definition. Now you can't do that in Python. Python, you have to do it in the middle. Here, you got a lot of flexibility in a variety of TypeScript and different class mechanisms to the structure. So we can take the name right out and just use it as a closure through our entire function. So it's fantastic. You just set them up right top and then the entire function there. So you don't have to like add, you know, things here where you're just structuring things. Right at the top, the entire function, no matter how you nest dens or not, they can all use it from the top. So just a, a wonderful, wonderful way of doing things. So if we fix it and then try to run again, so let's do start three. It'll go ahead and compile recognize that this is in the wrong order. So it just confirms what we saw in our IDE. So we're gonna change that. Thank you compiler for finding I did something in the wrong order and I created it incorrectly and I fixed that as well. So now everything looks good from a compiler perspective and we actually run, even using that destructuring, the compiler checks everything and everything looks good. We got a name of Jesse, a phone is correct, age and so forth. So even if they were to get some nasty things in here, then our validators at runtime would have our, have our back. So we could further increase those. But the basics, avoiding primitive session, making our code a lot more readable, makes it like this. Now, if you want to create DTOs and have like a constructor, so it's a new name, you can also do that as well. I just like the record syntax because I like using the basic types. I'm a functional developer with an imperative streak, so I'm, I'm easier to do types. Plus, we're not gonna extend these. These are very narrow types, meaning they, they can't be extended or modified, which is exactly what we want. We want to make sure that only the name and phone goes in there. So a lot less flexibility, which is good. That's what you want in your compiler. Okay, that's TypeScript, basically using types, or if you want to use classes or interfaces, that's cool too. It's just a way to wrap them, and then you can much easier to structure them instead of TypeScript compared to Python, for example. But you can make TypeScript work for you. Let's take a look at Rescript because it's very similar to TypeScript, but with a lot less type noise, but it has a really interesting way of doing type aliases that are more differential compared to TypeScript if you want to wrap them. They look very similar to, I would say, data classes in Python. All right, so same problem. We call a person that either works or doesn't. 
and we've got the same problem. We have the, the actual n number in the wrong position. And let's just take a look at that function real quick. We got a team, a name, a string, and an name. Now, you do not have to do this in Rescript. In fact, it's encouraged that you don't. You make it look like the camel syntax, right? I just put it here so if you're from a TypeScript background, it makes you feel more comfortable. It looks basically the same thing. And we just chain things together, right? We just very similar to our result. It's very similar to our promise. It just chains things together and either an okay or an error comes out, very similar to our promise. So the primitives make things bad <laughs> because they're in the wrong order. So let's run our compiler real quick. The one nice thing about Rescript, when you run start, it's, it'll compile every file in there. It's not like TypeScript where if you're passing a star or passing a particular file, we're just going to run everything. So we're going to run start. It's going to compile every single Rescript. Now you saw how fast that was, right? Which is just wonderful. It's, it's, it's unbelievably fast. Every time I save a file, it just, you know, instantly recompiles things. Such a, such a wonderful thing. So that's one of the nice things that Rescript has. One of the many, but from a type perspective, it's just the, one of the fastest compilers on the planet because it's built on a camel. So if we go to git person, it, everything looks good, but we know from our primitives that that's wrong. So we're gonna open a new terminal here and we're just gonna run that file that it generated. So we'll go node, source, person one, MJS, we're using modules nowadays. Ha ha ha. And you can see the phone cannot be one character. So the compiler said everything's good, but the runtime. So same problem in Python, same problem in TypeScript. We have the exact same primitive problem in Rescript. So although Rescript, its types are soundly typed, so a lot more guaranteed at runtime compared to TypeScript, a lot more strict about what you can do, a lot more thorough in terms of there's massive, massive type differences between null and undefined, for example. All of that goes away <laughs> because we're using primitives. And so even with a soundly typed language, we can still bypass those guarantees. So let's, let's use, stop using primitives and see how we can fix that. So let's go to person two. We, we see that we still have the same concept of the types that, that we use is the same, but we've actually given those types kind of a, a set of names as well. So aliases, just like before, name, age, and phone. So we can create the same type of aliases that we did in TypeScript. We say type name string. The only difference is really between TypeScript is that they have to be lowercased, right? Modules are allowed to be uppercase. But same problem. If we save this, you can see the compiler is not mad. And if we run person two dot, MGS. We have the same exact problem with the phone. So type aliasing, Rescript is very similar in, at least in some of these things, it's, it's not nominal, it's structurally typed. And so it looks very similar because they're both strings. So that's not gonna solve our problem. So let's use a, a interesting syntax of type aliasing that only exists in ML type languages like Rescript or Elm, for example. And that is, we rename the type of name to a name that takes a string. And so it's lowercase, but the uppercase, we can create whatever we want off to the right because it's a custom type that we made up. So now that we do this style of syntax, you can think of it in your head like a function. And since there's a difference between the way the functions are named, like name and phone, that although they might take the first parameter, they're completely different functions. In this case, they're completely different types. And so now Rescript is smart enough to tell the difference. So we have the name, just like we did the data classes in Python. Let's go ahead and put it to the end and see if we can get our compiler to help us here if we were to accidentally put them in the wrong order and not use a, a record to solve this whole problem. So already you can see it's compile error and it's saying this is not expected to have type name. The phone does not belong to the type name. So the compiler isn't, is, isn't as clear, but if you look up, you can see that phone does not belong. And that's because it's looking for name, the actual name of the person. And so we can do the same thing with age. We can put him first and get a very similar compiler error of, of the age is not a name. So the compiler is helping us from that perspective, which is fantastic. So that's Rescript using those renamed typed aliases where you wrap them with that. The only downside to this, and this is the cost of doing this, is that although the compiler helps you and it feels very similar to the data classes of Python, right? It's very similar to use. You can go in there, you can destructure it if you want, but I delegated it out. And the reason I delegated it out is that these, unfortunately, have to unwrap it. They have to know that it's a phone type and then unwrap it. Good news, you only have to do one switch. So if you're not familiar with pattern matching, think of it like a switch statement that can look inside your type. So the other, the other nice thing too is that it guarantees that you cover all bases. So you know how some people leave out the default in the switch or maybe their switch statement is missing a case? If you're using these kind of types, the compiler won't let you forget something. So if you misspell it, it's like, nope, 
Now, whatever the data is inside of it, you can call that whatever you want. But this is how we get the data out of those types. So we're not going to do structure. You could if you wanted, but it's safer to do a switch statement. Guarantee it comes out and you know that it's legit. Then you can run your validation. Okay. So that's the only cost of doing these types. You have to unwrap them. And I think most of us would say, well, given how small the switch is, it's only one, it's probably the worst of the trade off. But you could disagree, and that's fine. Let's take a look, super soundly strict type language called Elm. Let's take a look at our first Elm file here. And if you're not familiar with Elm, it is very similar to Haskell. It's for building browser-based applications, and it is almost or more so strictly typed and soundly typed than Rescript. When, Elm is famous for a couple of things. First, when it compiles, it works, just because its compiler is super strict. Second, the compiler errors themselves are probably the best in the industry in terms of that. And another nice thing, it's really fast. <laughs> so if you're used to Rescript, it's not as fast as Rescript, but it certainly feels light years fast compared to TypeScript. So same concept, we get a person based on a name and calling functions instead of Elm, you don't need parentheses or commas. You just call the function name and give it the parameters in the order, right? So case statement here, very similar to the switch statement in Rescript or uh, switch statement in JavaScript. It's just since it's using our wonderful discriminated union there, or type alias of variance, it's either or of the error or okay. And if we miss one, the compiler would say, hey, uh, you know, you forgot one, bro. You got to do both. So you can see if we scroll down, you can see it's like, oh, you're missing a possibility. You got to put okay with some kind of value that comes out of it. You got to handle that. If you don't care, just put a, an underscore. What we do, we want to we wanna get the person that comes out of the validation and go ahead and make one, right? So it either worked or it didn't. Now, Elm is nice as a front end language because it has a UI. So let's take a look at localhost here. And when we click that button, that's what's actually gonna make the person. It's gonna run this little message here. If you're from a Redux perspective, or if you have a Redux background where you're recognizing action creators, run your reducer, your update is basically your reducer function. It takes these actions, in this case, a very typed message, and whatever the message says, whatever data it has, you pull it out and you run it. So we only have one message in this app called make person. So we only have to handle, you know, one thing in our reducer. Let's click make person. It said it failed to make a person. Phone can't be less than nine characters. And the reason is that even in Elm, we've completely sabotaged our compilers about to help us because we're using primitives. So let's go take a look at get person. And the types are on top. So I'm not going to uncommon it, but think of it like that. The types are kind of inferred. You can add this. It's a good practice to add it because you get better compiler error messages. But even using Elm syntax of team, we now have a primitive int primitive. <laughs> so int primitive too, but like these could be out of order and you saw what happened when they are, right? So same exact problem of validating. The validators find the problems at runtime, but not when we compiled. So let's see what we can do to make things a little bit better. So we'll go to main two Elm. We'll stop this one, and people run start two. And I'm going to shrink this a bit. I just want you to be able to see the compiler errors that appear. All right, so our make get person, let's take a look. It has a name, age, and phone. So we've done the type alias thing as we did before. Let's go take a look at how we define that. So instead of having just our record with you know a team, but then we have strings, whatever, now it's actually a type. So we done the same thing we did in TypeScript, the same thing we did in Rescript, we created a type alias. It's just another name. So a string, another name for name is string. And so that type alias or is good and bad. It's good from a readability perspective. It's very clear now what those are, but it's bad in that the compiler is still not smart enough to help us. So if we reload this and click it, we have the exact same problem. When you call that function with the parameters out of order, it doesn't work because it can't tell the difference between the two. So type aliases aren't good enough. You gotta do something very similar to you do in Rescript where you wrap it with a type alias that actually creates a, a wrapper around it. And it's a little bit easier to do here because they look the same, type name, so it's not like lowercase and uppercase. They effectively are the same thing. But again, think in your head like this is a function and name is a differently named function than phone. So although they might take the first parameter, they're completely different names. And now these types mean something to the compiler because the compiler can tell the difference structurally just because of the name, right? So when we go down to our function that actually creates it, you can see already we're getting compiler errors that it's not supposed to be in that order. So let's hit save here. 
start the third one. And let's see if the compiler can catch that over there. We'll reload. There we go. And you can see that name Jesse is supposed to be a phone. So our compiler is finding the two problems of those things being the wrong order. Fix that to be in the right order. Put the phone last. Put the name first. Make a person. And now it made it successfully. Fantastic. So you can see the compiler fixed it. It worked at runtime. And again, if you want to create a DTO or an Elm in a Rescripts case, or even TypeScript, a record that strongly type these things in order, you can totally do that. It's just nice in that we might use these types for other functions. And it's a really small way, really a lot less, lot, not a lot to type, to define that type. So it can be passed in the functions and records, very flexible. So that's why type, type aliases like this, where you wrap the type is really nice. Now, from an unwrap perspective, let's take a look at that. Again, very similar to Rescript. You only have to do one case to unwrap it. It's not like Python or TypeScript where you go, this thing dot, right? Or, and you could destructure it if you want, but we're just doing the simple unwrap and then validating that internally. So a little bit more work to unwrap your types. But again, I think the trade-off is worth it. So that's how you do it in Elm. Very similar to Rescript. A little bit in common with TypeScript. So what happens if you don't have a typed language? What if you're not even using a compiler? You're using a dynamic language like Lua or JavaScript. Let's talk about Apollo. If you're not familiar, GraphQL is a way to very similar to TypeScript or Elm or Rescript where you take types and you wrap it around your domain. Sometimes you're just playing with ideas and you're quickly adding you know, primitive types, but other times you wanna map your data, not just in your program, but across server boundaries. And so I'm gonna send strongly typed data from the front end using TypeScript to a strongly typed back end using TypeScript and Node, for example. How do you guarantee that your data you send over REST stays the same type? Well, GraphQL. That's how it says when the client sends a person to the server, the server knows that it's a person. And it handles all the parsing and all the transfer for you. It's a fan, fantastic way. GraphQL is a fantastic way for typed systems to talk to each other. But you can build a back-end type system so using Apollo in JavaScript. You don't have to do it. As long as you get the structure right, it's good enough. And so that's what's great about using JavaScript is that you can quickly do these things. You can interface with typed people, but at the same time, you yourself, you're not typed. Very similar types we're going to get from the front end. These should look very familiar. An enum with blue or red. The person inputs is a record. Their explanation point means they can't be null. So there's no like team that's either A, a team, or B, null. No. All of these are there. They have to be null. They can't be undefined or whatever. And we kind of did things a little duplicated. We have a, a person input, which is basically the same as a person, but GraphQL wants you to define your inputs to functions completely separate. And so the convention is to just put a suffix after it. So input person input instead of type person. But beyond that, we know they're structurally the same, right? We, we know they basically mean the same thing. And the functions is going to ask the client say, hey, can you create this in the database? And the backend is going to be like, sure, no problem. And I, here's the person I created for you. So let's take a look at how you would do that in Apollo. If you never used Apollo, you can use it both for servers, so EC2s or some kind of cloud provider running a server, or with a little modification, only three lines of code, you can use the same Apollo server in a serverless environment. So if you want to create a Apollo server that takes inputs and outputs and write in JavaScript, you can totally do that too. So we're going to do the server for now, just so I can show it running and see how it works. It's going to read that schema that I just showed you, and whenever you make GraphQL queries against it or mutations, the server is going to know what to do because it's reading the schema. So it's the same thing the client side is going to use. And we kind of hard coded some people here, team name, age, phone, right? So they look the same. The resolvers is when somebody makes a query to you, Apollo is going to be like, all right, how do I handle this create person? So it's going to look at the mutations object and say, is there a create person? And you're going to say, yeah, it's a function right here. And they go, fantastic. So here's my parent that I'm wired up to. Here's the arguments I got from the client. Here's some context if you care. It's more info about request. All we really care about is that we just need to send, hey, this is what the client sent us, and we're gonna, for now, hard code a value back just to get it up and running. Eventually, this would probably go to a database somewhere, right, to get these persons. But we just wanna get it up and running and give the client-side developer some data so he can play while we continue to build our server. And so they want one person back from that great person, we're gonna send them a person back, right? So it looks good. So let's start this. Node server one, and it's gonna run an Apollo server. And you can see it's running at 4,000. So we're going to query our server. We have our server running right now, and we can write a query against it. And so 
when you write queries in GraphQL, if you've never done this before, basically what you're looking at is a server running locally. And it, remember how it read our schema? So it can see what you can actually do based on that schema. So we're gonna do our mutation. We're gonna add it there. It's gonna kind of cogen the operation we wanna do. And it only has one mutation we can do, and that's create person. So you wanna call the create person mutation. Now, this takes some arguments, okay? So we're gonna add on that person, and these are the following fields. If you look at team and age, these are the parameters that is required from the client. So when I'm on this server right now in this browser and I hit send, it's gonna send this data like it's from the client. So it allows you to test your server without having to like have an LMAP or a React app up. You could just you know test here. Give it a name of Jesse here, team of red, age of 42. So the data types are all legit. Now we're just missing our actual fields on the mutation itself. So we'll add those. We want to get all the fields back. So let's run our mutation and see what happens. Now, if you don't get errors, that means that most of it all worked. There still could be errors and some of it worked, but usually you want all it worked or none of it worked. <laughs> you don't like anything in between. So we see that the data we got back from our create person mutation was the person object is structured. We got all those fields. So this works great. This is fantastic. But watch what happens when the client screws up. So we're going to say Jesse in the phone number, and we hit a mutation. It responds back with the static data, but there's no, there's no checks there because those are, those are primitive in GraphQL. There's no difference between a phone and name because they're both strings. So GraphQL, you're breaking the way for two things to talk to each other because you're using primitives in your GraphQL schema. This has far-reaching effects, not just now on the client or the server. It's both. And this is why primitive obsession and something as important as a graphical schema can be a really big problem. So let's take a look at what we can do to improve that. So we're gonna stop here. Let's open our schema too and see how we improve things. So this should look familiar at this point. We have wrap types, right? An input type of name, name. The only difference is the input, right? We're trying to follow the standards here. We're gonna change the, the input from the untrusted source that is the client. We're JavaScript, we know what we're doing. <laughs> we don't really care about the server types, but we wanna make sure our GraphQL is fixed. So we take our GraphQL and fix it. And if we look at server two, not much has changed. We still have the same response. The only difference is we're pulling in a completely different schema, right? That's it. So everything else is basically the same. So let's run our server two here. We'll go back to our GraphQL. And we'll have the exact same send here, okay? But notice how it's expecting an object. So already we're getting compilers because it's expecting an object for a phone input. So let's change that. Let's go to, our, if you're not familiar, let's go back to what is a phone input? Well, a phone input is a object with a phone. Now, when you're sending this from a client, the Apollo client here, what this will do is it'll make calls or queries to your Apollo backend. And this is something that a lot of times most people would use in React, for example. You can use this in other JavaScripts. It doesn't have to be React, it could be Angular, it could be raw JavaScript, it could be Elm, for example. But we're gonna make a, a call to our, our backend here and the save person. This is the mutation, the one we're concerned about. See how it's got team, name, age, and phone, right? So the structuring helps because now the order doesn't really matter. So that destruction of passing the fields that you want to get back is kind of nice. But this person input is still a record. So that kind of helps. The problem is the function takes them in as inputs. So if we look down here, the good news is when we get it into the record, uh, the, the order doesn't matter, right? It's team, age, phone number. Those are any order. It doesn't matter. The problem is the function still has the same problem of the ordering problem with primitives, right? So we pass in the phone number and then we run, let's open another one here, node client one. You can see that it sent it back, the person correctly. But if we take a look at our Apollo, it had things in the wrong order. So we're, we're allowing the client to send bad data to the server. So you can significantly prevent things by defining your client side code in JavaScript to make it better. So let's see how we can make things better. So we'll go to client two here. And very similar to Python data classes, we've created these types, very similar to the TypeScript, where they're just a function and we just return the exact same thing we pass in wrapped in an object, that's it, right? So it looks like a type, but it's really just a function that takes in a name. So we can treat it very similar to the data classes that we did in Python. And the good news is that when you call save person, it's gonna take those, but we can destructure them. So right now, if you look at what it's sending, let's, let's show you now that we have that running, let's start server two here. 
inside of our things here, you can also write it as a record syntax if you want, right? So I just thought this was a lot more terse and a lot, a lot easier to read than a record syntax, which requires braces and things like that. This is just, to me, a lot more clear, a lot less the code, a lot easier to read. And two, CJS. And you can see that it created a person using those primitives and it got the person back. But let's take a look at what it actually sent on the back end. So if you look at the back end, the args it got sent were object nested in objects. I like it this way because it matches the schema. So if you look at the schema two, this input is simply wrapped. So now we have a strongly typed way to handle it on the back end. Now we're using JavaScript, sure, but we get better errors when we take this data and shove it to things because it's going to be wrapped in an object. So it's just safer from the client, validated on the back end. And then in JavaScript's world, once we have these objects, we can destruction them, use them. It's just a lot easier to read. So let's take a look at server two. Again, the only difference really here is the schema. But when we get those objects from the front end, you would have to destructure them from the args, right? So they'd be wrapped in those objects. So that's a better way to do it. It's just, again, in this case, we're wrapping those objects in the actual schema input types. And you could do the return types if you wanted to as well. That's how you do it in GraphQL, using a dynamic language like JavaScript. Let's talk about Dull. So if you're not familiar with Dull, Dull is a way to do strongly typed programming, very similar to Elm or Rescript or TypeScript, but for your configuration files. Anybody who's ever read some of the most glorious screw ups of when a server went down somewhere, right? It's always a config file that deployed, locked them out of servers. So it's not always coders. Sometimes it's coders just doing quote unquote simple config changes, right? And so this is where Dull is really nice because you can get deterministic outputs, really good compiler, and it can generate your JSON or YAML rather than you doing it by hand. And anybody who's ever done like true or false in YAML versus like, was it zero to one in strings? It's just awful. It's absolutely awful. And you can break an entire back end by just one line of code. Where if you use dull and types, it makes things better. But again, even dull with its not turning complete, super powerful language, what you're trying to do in this case is generate some IM policies. So if you're not familiar with IM policies, in AWS, whatever you deploy, whether server, serverless, code, doesn't matter, it has to have permissions to do things. And every piece of infrastructure usually has some kind of IAM role to say what it's allowed to do and who's allowed to do it. And that each one of these things is I'm allowed to describe my log streams here. I'm allowed to put logs here. So this is for our Lambda to log code, right? It just wants to send logs to normal log streams with a specific name. And we use star to say, well, we don't care what the log stream is named as long as it has this prefix for this account, okay? So there's a couple problems with this. If you're not familiar with ARNs, think of these as URLs. This is a way to identify your infrastructure. If I deploy a Lambda, it's called AWS ARN AWS Lambda. If it's a log for CloudWatch, it's ARN AWS Logs, right? They all have the exact same structure. The next is region. Is it east? Is it west? Are you overseas somewhere? Are you in Australia, Asia Pacific? Where are you? So you, you put the region there. Then you have your AWS account number. So a lot of people will have different accounts for their QA and prod. That way, if they deploy something on QA and it's catastrophic, it can't in any way affect prod. And that's very normal. This is what you do. Then at this point, we don't care. Star means anything after that. So that could be names like for the log group and the types, whether it's AWS Lambda or AWS Step Function, blah, blah, blah. So we just use star as a way to say whatever. So these are very, very important to work. And they're very, very easy to screw up. Case in point, this could be backwards. This could be west instead of east. You could deploy East resources on West. It's really easy to mess up. So you write in dull, which is at the top, you'll have a bunch of lets, which are basically like variables and functions and types. So variable, another discriminated union and a function. And all functions are Lambda functions, which means they all take one parameter. So if you want to have a function take more than one, it's basically curried. So it takes one or it's a function that returns a function that takes one. But all you care about is, okay, this function takes two parameters. That's really all you care about, as long as you call it with two, okay? So what we do in Dull is we define what our variables are. We know what our account number is. We know what our lambda is. And so we're not going to repeat ourselves there. We only need to find it once, even though our policy at runtime does it a bunch. But regions could be either or. It could be east or west. So we define an or type there. And that way, a region, whenever we use it, has to be one of the two. Then a render region 
we'll take that region and convert it to what the text is. So this is a very common theme is you define your type and you have a way to render that type to JSON or render that type to YAML, okay? So you render the value, DAW will take care of formatting the JSON or formatting the YAML based on your structure of your records. That one's pretty simple. You call render region with east and it'll render this out as a string. Pretty straightforward. Log stream, you can see it has that very specific format, but the region's dynamic. So we use the template string, if you're from JavaScript background, this should look very familiar, where we inject that variable, but we're rejecting the result of region. So if you pass a region, it's gonna be either US East one or, what's the other one? US West two, right. You, one of the two there. And then our count ID is just a variable that we pass in from the function and it's text, so we're good to go. Now already your spidey sense and alarm bell should be going off when you see all this text <laughs> all over the place. That's a primitive and we should be avoiding these things. Now a statement is, what are you allowed to do? Well, I'm allowed to do these things for these resources. This Lambda is allowed to affect these CloudWatch logs and, and by putting log messages, for example. Can't delete, but it can certainly put log messages and write there. So that's kind of what you're, you're rendering the statements out. Then the log group is different than the log stream. And so you have your region and account ID, okay? So let's go down to the actual application logic. We're gonna start putting all these these functions and types that we built together to create our policy in a very correct way. So we know for now we're in East, okay? We're not gonna do East and West, we're not gonna do cross region deployment, we're just gonna hard code it to East, but at least you can't screw it up now because it's always gonna render the same. So you write it in one place, don't repeat yourself, and it renders out. We wanna describe the log streams on the group as a whole, and the render log stream is gonna say the current region, and then what our account ID, and then make that big ARN. That's really all it does. Same thing for the log group. The only difference between these two is how you format the yarn and what you're allowed to do. You can see that this is different. We have a log group with a region, but the Lambda names before the account ID and the account IDs before the Lambda name. So that order looks kind of weird there, but the compiler isn't gonna tell you Jack because it's primitive. So after the end is where you start building your object. Since we're doing JSON, we're gonna do the syntax like this, and it'll render this out to JSON. So, all right, so, so far, everything looks pretty good, and that's fantastic, but again, we're using primitives. So you could very easily say, wait, that looks different than below. Let me just go ahead and do this. Although they're two completely different functions, you wanted to keep things consistent. So when you rerun that same command, and then take a look at what it generated, something's a little funky with this. You have your, your Lambda name, where the account goes and the account is the Lambda log stream. So this is, this IAM role is completely sabotaged. If you uploaded it, you would break all your infrastructure, even without a code deployment. And it's very, very dangerous. This is a very, very dangerous file to mess up. How do we fix that? Well, just like we fixed everything else. So we'll go to policy two and see what we can do to improve our situation here. So we define types around our accounts. We have an account ID that's wrapped with an ID of text. Lambda name that's wrapped with the name of text. Now we have clear records that differentiate between the two because they have different names and different types. And we still have to render them. So people have to know what an account ID is, but it's really easy, they're a record. So you can guarantee that the dot will work. This isn't like JavaScript or Python where you can't guarantee dots will work. Once you have a record like this, you're good to go. You know it's, now, it doesn't mean that it's empty text, <laughs> right, but it's a start. So you have account ID, you can generate that, when we look at our Lambda name, we can guarantee that our Lambda.name and account.id are two separate things. So even if they're in different orders, right, between these two functions, one second and one third, you can still guarantee the types are in the right order, which means that when you initiate those values, we cast it as an account ID, and then we set the value just to be very, very clear, right? You don't have to do this, but I'll show this in a minute. Now that we have our values as clear definitive types, when we pass them in there, we're, we're good because the order matters. So let's run this. We'll do it with our policy two here and go to policy two.json. So let's take it policy two. Everything rendered, it looks good so far. So let's see if we can duplicate the same bug. We like, oh, that looks like the wrong order. I want these two to be consistent. Yeah, 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 okay. That looks better. When you go to run it, the compiler error will say, hey, this is the wrong function type argument. One's expecting name but you pass an ID, what's going on? And so it shows this particular function at 57, render log group, 
is expecting the current region and current account ID. And that current account ID has an ID, but it should have been named. Name's missing. That's what the, the minus means. It's missing. You added this, but this is what's missing. So the structure of the record's wrong. And that's because this has a dot ID and this has a dot name. So we can change the order of the types, rerun, compiler's happy, everything generated. That is how you avoid primitive obsession in Dahl by just using types. It makes the code easier to read. It's very clear what those types are doing. So that is primitive obsession, ladies and gentlemen, and how you fix it in six different programming languages of Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, Rescript, Elm, and Dahl, and Apollo, GraphQL. Same thing as JavaScript. And you can see that it, you put all this effort in some of these compile languages, you compile it doesn't work. That's frustrating. So creating these custom types allows you to leverage the tool that you put all this work in. If you're going to take the burden of types and add that readability cost and add that extra code cost and that, that lack of terseness that you get in dynamic languages without types, you want to make sure that effort has a return on investment. And using these custom types to avoid the primitives is a wonderful way to do that. Guaranteed we can compile it works. Second, a lot of the ways you can do this in certain languages is very terse. So it keeps it really nice and readable, but still allows the compiler to know what you meant. And future you or your coworkers reading this code are more likely to know the order, more likely to understand these things and have these primitives that they can use that are safe for the compiler for domain modeling purposes. So for example, if you're getting data from a database, from a backend microservice, and you only need some of it modeled a completely different way for your front end through GraphQL, having these little primitives that you can attach together in other records Super helpful, wonderful. That's how you do it. Hopefully seeing all these languages gave you context, showed you the trade-offs, showed you different strategies, and shows how even some of the most powerful compilers completely miss stuff and how sometimes runtime validation is helpful as well in a soundly typed language. It's just a great way to have both. And hopefully by seeing all of them, you can see how it makes the code more readable. So you got any other questions? My name is Jesse Warden. Happy to help. Hit me up in the comments if you got any other questions. Otherwise, I hope you learned something. Hopefully it was helpful. Hope it gave you context and makes your code just better, more readable. Laid up.